got the joy of the Lord and His working in me. I've got the joy of the Lord and His showing in me. I've got the joy of the Lord and His plan to see. I've got the joy of the Lord. I'm so glad I've got the joy of the Lord. I've got my faith. Hello, and welcome to our fifth session of the letter to the Philippi Church, we call Philippians, and uh, we're in chapter 2, and beginning today in the middle of a song. I didn't really introduce it as such last week, but in the second chapter, beginning uh, with verse 5 through 11, it is offset in prose in some of your translations because it is thought to be a early first Christian hymn. We know this to be a book, we believe, from the Roman prison, imprisonment, and there are hints even in this chapter that make us to believe that Paul had some hope of being released, which we believe he was released, and then imprisoned again after a certain uh, allowance of time to visit some of the churches. So in the second chapter, we are bid by the Apostle Paul with the church at Philippi to have the same mind of Christ. And then in verses 5 through 8, we find the first verse of this song talking about how Christ humbled himself. This is chapter 2, beginning with verse 5 through 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it, and I like the translation, something to be used for his own advantage. So in other words, he let go so that he could come to earth, but made himself, that is his choice, his will, along with God's will, he gave himself to coming to earth, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and becoming in the likeness of men. So you see this descending. He let go of what he had in heaven and its glory, and he descended to being a servant in the likeness of men, and, verse 8, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself further as a human being, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Obedient means that he gave himself to the will of God, and he gave himself, in this context, of what was best for others. He did not think of his own interest, but the interest of others. So he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And we talked about the meanings of those words last week. So again with verse 2 in chapter, nine, chapter 2, verse 9, which keeps now talking about how he was exalted. God, when someone humbles himself, will exalt that person. And the same is true with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the God who came and became flesh, John 1, 14, and this flesh became his sacrifice for sin. You remember how we read, and I love this passage from Hebrews, the 10th chapter, when Jesus is talking about what he became was an offering. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, meaning the Old Testament's animal sacrifices, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. In the body that God prepared for him. How so? Well, the Holy Spirit himself was that which was with Mary in the womb and became what was then born, the only begotten Son of God in flesh. So now... Therefore, verse 9, because of that humbling, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Now that's an interesting expression. If God gave him something that he had not yet had, what was that name? We know that the name of Jesus became so very important, even as he was here on earth, the demons could not resist when Jesus spoke to them to come out of a person. Uh, we know that in Acts, we read that it's the only name 
given among men whereby we must be saved. So in the name of Jesus, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name that, here's what happens, here's the result of what happens when this name is mentioned or given or recognized that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow. How many? Every. Of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth. This means in heaven the exalted ones who have already died, and the souls of just men made perfect, also the angels of course, all in heaven will recognize this name that is given to Jesus. And the knee shall bow in worship of those on the earth, means all of those of course living on the earth, every knee shall bow. And of those under the earth, and this means the lost souls of the universe, the fallen Christians and the humans who have lived on earth and have died without salvation. Even those will be made to bow the knee. Verse 11, and that every tongue, again, how many tongue? Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now the word Lord was used in his recognition here on earth, but it also now has a new meaning because once Jesus came in the flesh, fulfilling the will of God, he gave his three years or so of ministry, presenting himself as God's son by his miracles. In his uh, kindness, his uh, mercy, uh, his, his wondrous love for people, he gave them healing of body and soul. He was the word of God. Again, remember in John the first chapter, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. And that word became flesh, chapter 14, uh, verse 14, and it was the word, it was God's word that Jesus came to share. And so now, when is this time that every knee will bow and every name will just confess, made to do so by the very presence of Jesus? Well, I believe that, of course, to mean during the day of judgment. Because when he comes again, all that are in the grave will be raised and they will be made to bow, to bow. All that are with him and come and put together with their resurrected and glorified body, of course, they will be praising, bowing in worship and uh, confessing that great name, Jesus is Lord. And uh, at that time, of course, even those who are raised from the grave that are disobedient and the demons themselves will have no choice but to bow the knee and c confess that Jesus is Lord. That became quite a biphrase of the first century Christian. It was sort of like the Jewish phrase, shalom, or peace. They always greeted shalom. And now, in the first century, the Christians would greet each other, Jesus is Lord. It is even thought to be a password to enter into perhaps secret meetings of the Christians, Jesus is Lord. And so, when talking about this, even Paul says in 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Meaning that the words of truth are really proven by the Holy Spirit. And when you utter those, you are literally using the power of the Holy Spirit to say and confess, Jesus is Lord. And that's in 1 Corinthians 12 and 3. So it's all, though, to the glory of God. Jesus came that God's will might be done, but that in completing his will here on earth, he would glorify the Father. Remember that he prayed in John Father, now glorify me with the glory we had from the beginning. And so, having done his will here on earth, he was raised to walk a new life, but he was also exalted by God to sit upon the throne and to have this name of Lord take on even new meaning. He was king of kings. He was the head of the church. He was Lord of all. So, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. 
This exaltation of Jesus reminds us when we studied Ephesians in the first chapter, and beginning with verse 20 through 23, how he was exalted above all. It's talking about his mighty power, God, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in the age, this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So this raising or exaltation has come after Jesus emptied himself and became man and became servant and then was obedient even to death and even that the death of the cross. And so now he is exalted above all others, every name, every principality or power. He is king of kings, lord of lords. He is certainly sitting on the throne and reigning in his kingdom, the church. So now we enter into verse 12. After this song is completed, that being the second verse we studied today. First verse to talk descending by humility. The second verse talking about exaltation by God to his place which he now employs in heaven. Verse 12, therefore, because of that, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We understand that to be, be obedient, be submissive in your mind. We talked about last week, now in your body. Be submissive, be obedient, and by such you will be completing the work of salvation which God has started in you. In fact, the very next verse, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We understand that we cannot be saved by works, and so working out our own salvation with fear and trembling doesn't mean that we work to the point where we earn salvation. Again, we remember Ephesians 2 and verse 8 that speaks directly against that. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But now listen, not of works, our salvation isn't by works, but the very next verse in 10 talks about works. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, excuse me, <coughs> for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I believe that's what it means when it says work out your own salvation. We work because we have been saved. We work because it's a sacrifice which we give, which is our spiritual latria or work or worship in Romans 12, 1 and 2. So he tells them here to work out your, fear, your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you both to will, to decide, and to do, action, that which is his good pleasure. Uh, remembering Hebrews 13, another incident where these works of what we can do in good deeds are mentioned, verses 20 and 21. <clears throat> now may the Lord of, or God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through his blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So again, here it is God who works in us to do his will, through Jesus Christ. So that's what he's saying here in this text that we're reading, is that you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, yes. But what it means is you continue the work because God is working in you, and you give yourself to the work of good deeds. And there's some results in that, which we're going to look at in, in the remaining of this, uh, these verses. 
because when you do so, you become a light bearer. You shine as lights in a dark world. Uh, let's look at verse 14. <clears throat> now, as you're working these good works, 14 says, Do all things without complaining and grumbling. So it doesn't do any it doesn't do any magnification of Jesus Christ. It doesn't give any light if we do good works and we're complaining about it or grumbling about it. Uh, that's like uh, being a, a, a false hypocrite to do good works and then grumble about having to do them. We want to do them from the heart because we want to make our lives a living sacrifice. So do all things without complaining and disputing, or that negates the light that you could be. And then verse 15, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. Here, the author, I may have said Paul a few times, the author is trying to give a great contrast. You live in a dark age. You live in a perverse, a crooked generation. But if you do these good works, if you are the extension of the life of Christ, if you submit yourself to living in the light as he is in the light, then you're going to become a magnifier again of Jesus Christ in the flesh. You will give that light, which is the light of life. In fact, in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, we, <clears throat> we magnify what Jesus said according to John 14. I think it's in verse 6. Uh, I am the light of the world. Uh, he wants the world to be able to see the, the light that he brings, and he says that is the light of life. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now in Matthew 15, uh, 5, and uh, beginning with verse 14, he tells his disciples, You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house, or for that matter, to all who observe your lives. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So we reflect the light of Jesus by doing those good works. We work out our own salvation with fear and trembling by giving ourselves to the will of God and allowing our works to shed their own light on the life of a Christian and on Jesus Christ, the light of life, himself. So this radiance that we can accomplish is that which uh, is the privilege and the responsibility for all of us as Christians to accomplish. It was John 8 and 12, by the way, that I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, how do we do that? Verse 16 says, Holding fast the word of life. Again, holding fast Jesus. He who follows me does not walk in darkness, and he has the light of life. And we hold forth that light. To me, this sort of indicates holding forth a torch, if you will. Uh, when I was in Papua New Guinea, I learned uh, to work with uh, some missionaries and over there we didn't have any electricity and they call their flashlights a torch <laughs> and so they'd say don't forget your torch and so uh, my elder and I would always grab our uh, flashlights and they were very very meaningful both in the forest uh, or the jungle and uh, even during our night uh, when the lights which were generated for a while were turned off the torch the light that's what we hold forth, so that you can see and so that others may see. 
how to walk in the light of Jesus, the light of life. So holding fast the word of life so that I, and again here the writer, Paul, uh, would have the opportunity to have great gladness and joyfulness with all, with you all, along with you. Actually, uh, he, he talks about a word here that we would, in English, say cheering, uh, gladness, rejoicing with you as the Philippians. They would have great rejoicing, and so would the Apostle Paul because they had uh, walked according to the way that he had instructed them, which was the way of life, which was the way of Christ. And so for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Now he begins by saying, I know you have always obeyed, but now not as just in my presence only, but also in my absence, continue to do these things. The church at Philippi was uh, such a wonderful church to support Paul. They had such a wonderful relationship. And besides Christ here, and then the Christians themselves being light, he's going to bring forth two great examples, Timothy and Epaphroditus. Now, Timothy had been with him in Acts, the 16th chapter, when he first, first visited Philippi. Timothy was in that company, and uh, so they knew Timothy. They, Tim Timothy was well known to them, and according to Colossians, I'm sorry, Corinthians, uh, chapter 16 also, uh, he had been sent back to them at least once. Now, Timothy is with him in prison, and he says to the church at Philippi, I'm going to send Timothy. And there was a reason for that. So let's look at that. But I trust in the Lord, verse 19, that I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may also be encouraged when I know your state. He wants to send Timothy to the church at Philippi to see how they're doing. He wants to see if there are problems or if they have undergone certain uh, temptations or perhaps even persecutions that have drawn them away. So he says, I want to send Timothy so that I can be encouraged when I know your state of phys spiritual being. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. You know that Paul and Timothy were father and son. And uh, he lets them know, as they already know, that there's no one like Timothy. There's no one like Timothy with his dedication to Christ, no one to Timothy like his dedication to Paul, and no one like Timothy who's dedicated and concerned about the church at Philippi. He says, I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. The word sincerely, uh, of course, means uh, truthfully. It's a word that's usually used for a test. And once something is tested, it is known to be true. And this was Timothy's character. Uh, he will sincerely care for your state. For all who seek, for all seek their own. This seems to indicate that Paul maybe had some other uh, people that he had sent uh, to other places, whether at Philippi or other places, we don't know. For that matter, we don't really know any of the details what he's saying here, but all seek their own suggests that there have been other emissaries sent out from Paul in prison uh, who did not complete their assignment or did not report back. And he is saying, I'm sending Timothy. I'm sending the best. I'm sending someone I have all confidence in and you know very well so that I can hear from you and so that you can hear from me. Verse 22, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Again, in the past, in his first visit and sending them him back in at least once, they knew he had been proved, proven. Therefore, I hope to send him at once as soon as I see how it goes with me. He suggests that Things are, are not sure at all, and for that matter, he may keep Timothy just a little longer till he sees a little bit of the light of what the future may hold. 
So he's going to send him as soon as I know how it goes with me. And one of those reasons is because he wants to be able to send a message to the Philippians of how he is, how Paul is, that is truthful. It wouldn't be that he was holding him back because uh, he, he desired Timothy to serve him. It was so that he might send the latest news or the, the most truthful news that would be available. And then this verse 24. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. He is speaking of that word trust. I keep reminded of Psalms 57. Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me, for my soul trusts in you. And I have to remind myself of that quite, very, quite often. And I ask for the restoration of the joy within that only our trust in God can bring. And then he says about Epaphroditus. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, that is, in addition to Timothy. I also consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, but also your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Now, a little later on, I think it's chapter 4, he's going to talk about the Epaphroditus being the messenger that brought a gift, some monetary gift, from the church at Philippi, sent by the hands of Epaphroditus, uh, all the way to Rome from their part up in Macedonia in the northern section of Greece. And Epaphroditus had been that messenger, but he became ill while there. Now, I, I'm going to send him back since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. Uh, he was distressed because he knew the church there in Philippi would be concerned, uh, and he wanted them to know that he was now much better or even okay. So he says, For he indeed was sick almost unto death. Epaphroditus had gotten so ill that Paul thought he would die. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also. No doubt Paul prayed for Epaphroditus, as we do when we pray for those who are sick. But we must wait until God has shown us what is best for that person, even for us. And so we want to know here that Paul has prayed and that the answer was that Epaphroditus was brought back to hell. God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Lest I should have sorrow that here he came with this gift for me from you, and now he's gotten ill. And if he passed on, that would just add sorrow to the sorrow or the trials that he was having being imprisoned. And so a lot of love from the church through Epaphroditus to Paul, back through Epaphroditus and back to the church of Philippi. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly. And when you see him again, you may rejoice and I may be less sorrowful. He knows that they're going to have a great deal of rejoicing to do when Epaphroditus walks back into the church at Philippi. And he says, that will cause me less sorrow, less anxiety in one translation. So receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such men in esteem, such men as Timothy, such men as Epaphroditus, such men as Tychicus, or others who have faithfully executed what Paul had asked them to do for the Lord. So we need to also, as a church, uh, greet one another and, and just be exceedingly glad uh, that each of us are striving to show, hold forth the light of life in our lives. If one is sick, we're going to pray for that person. If he needs uh, or she needs something done physically, we want to do that. But we want to always praise God and if we're giving back someone who may have been so very, very ill, we are grateful and give thanks for that. If we see the fact that his life might be ended, we accept that that person, he or she, have been given as an offering, as a sacrifice. And with that, I'm going to go back up to 17 because uh, I've held it forth 
to be talking about pouring ourselves out. Yes, and I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. He's saying that I am being poured out. This is like a libation, some of your translations. It was to precede other sacrifices. And so he's being poured out on the sacrifice of the Philippians' faith. And he wants them to recognize that he may give his own life. He may give his own blood. But if he has to and is poured out, it will be added to their lives of faith and sacrifice to be well-pleasing and aroma to God. So I am glad and I rejoice with you if we have that opportunity. So let's give our lives in a living sacrifice. And on that faith, we shall have the teachers such as Paul, even though we never knew him personally, added as a libation of our sacrifice of faith on the altar of the New Testament. No more the Old Testament offerings, but now the offerings of ourselves as a living sacrifice. Next week, we'll start with chapter 3. I hope you'll join us again, and thank you for being with us today. God bless. I've got the joy of the Lord, and it's working in me. I've got the joy.